you were still a little sleepy because of the loss of the hour of sleep you got, you ought to be awake by now. Uh, yeah, we had one person in the 8 o'clock service show up about 10 minutes left in the service, all right? Uh, forgot to change that clock. We'll probably have a few think they're showing up on time for this one, and they're just going to be really, really early for the next one. And I thought about this. In the last service, there'll be some who will show up very late for that one, and they'll just go off and have lunch. <laughs> yeah, they'll just, they'll just take off. But anyway, uh, hey, uh, we've had a prodigal daughter return home today. Don McGinley, where are you? Where are you, Don? Stand up, girl. All right, good to have Dawn in church with us today. Her and her husband moved away to Florida on us, and uh, so she's back for a brief visit, and it's great to have her, uh, have her in worship with us today. She was able to be at uh, our ninth anniversary Celebrate Recovery event Thursday night, so we've had a chance to see her a couple of times already. May I direct your attention to the screen for a hearty New Hope welcome and announcements. Good morning and welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're a visitor with us today, we would love to get to know you a little bit more and hopefully you get to know us. So please take one of the connect cards that is in the pew in front of you and fill it out and put it in the offering plate when it comes around. Now we promise we're not going to come knock on your door or give you a phone call or cyber stalk you, but we just want to know you a little bit better so we can send you something in the mail and you can learn a little bit more about us. Because our vision statement here at New Hope is to compellingly communicate to everyone the all-absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. We're glad you're here. It's Mexico time. Pie auction is tonight. Doors open at 5.30. Make sure you bring all of your desserts and all of your goodies. Uh, I hear Pastor Tim is going to be auctioneering off some pretty great prizes, uh, possibly some bikes, tri-tip dinners. You might want to come and find out. This is a great way for us to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ in Mexico which is our, what this is all about. And we'll see you tonight. We have a Prime Timers Luncheon. If you don't know what Prime Timers Luncheon is, that's for people who are 55 years and older. That's 55 and older, and you're all welcome. We'd like you to come if it's your first time. If you're a regular, we really would like you to show. Come and bring a potluck entree or a dessert or both, and let's have a great time of fellowship and uh, maybe some special activities that day. We hope this Saturday is our all church work day. We start at 8 o'clock, but coffee will be on at 7.30. Now you ask, will there be breakfast? Who knows? Come and find out. But there will be a lot of fun stuff to do here. Men, if you like to build things and use your hammer and nails and all that, we got a job for you. Ladies, kids, everybody can come. It's a great way to beautify our campus and also get to know each other better. So come on out and join us for our work day. Wednesday nights are jam-packed here at New Hope. We have our family dinners at 6.15. We have our jam kids junior high, and adult Bible study at 7, and we even have a grief share program. Come and have a great time with us. You won't want to miss it. We are very blessed here at New Hope. We have events going on all during the week, and we have several Bible studies. If you're new to our church, you may not be aware, but on Tuesday nights, we have a men's Bible study and a women's Bible study, and they both start at 645 here on campus. Then Wednesday morning, we have two women's Bible studies that are going on simultaneously and they both start at 9.30 a.m. And then we wrap it up on Thursday morning with an early morning men's Bible study and they start at 6 o'clock. So if you want to get into the Word and learn a little bit more and get to know each other better, come on out and join us for one of these. The Widow's Lunch Brunch is meeting on the 21st at Sally Wallen's house. Information is in the bulletin. Call Sally if you want to know more. We are going to have a special surprise here for Palm Sunday this year at New Hope. Our children are going to sing in the Children's Easter Choir. They're going to perform at both services, 915 and 1045. And these kids are adorable. They're like a breath of fresh air. And they are going to compellingly communicate the gospel to us through song. You don't want to miss this. This is our future, so come and join us. Thank you for being here today. We are glad you're here. And we hope you experience Jesus right where you are. I want to give special thanks for our uh, 
on-screen video announcements. Dan Pierce, where are you? I know you're, Dan, right here. Uh, Chris has been working on this project, kind of getting us going with some of this. And Dan is the guy who puts it all together for us every week. He sort of teaches that at uh, Buchanan High School and... Uh, He's taken that on, so, so thanks. It makes it a little easier on my voice every Sunday morning because of that, and we're very grateful. Uh, in our last service, I don't know if she stayed over to see some of you or she's still in this service, but uh, a prodigal daughter came home this week, uh, Don McGinley. Uh, they moved away, her and her husband moved away to Florida, and uh, she came back for a short visit. She was able to be with us uh, Thursday night at our ninth anniversary celebration of Celebrate Recovery and was here in our last service. So I think she goes home the first part of this week, uh, but it was great to have her and good to see her. A um, couple of uh, updates to announcements made, and I want to amplify a couple of things. Number one, the work day on Saturday. We, uh, we've got a lot of projects uh, scheduled. We take any and all folks uh, who could be here as long as there's not a downpour rain. If you look at the calendar today, it tells us that uh, we've got rain from Tuesday through Saturday. In my experience, news, uh, weather people are not always correct. <laughs> like last week, they had snow for one day in Clovis. I missed it, all right? Um, but, but anyway, uh, we will send out an email on Friday to everybody if there's any question about whether we are going to have a work day on Saturday or not. Next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, there is going to be a, a seminar here. It'll go for about an hour. That, that includes uh, Q&A. It's called The Legacy of Generosity. Uh, Bob Price is uh, an accountant from the Fresno Clovis area. He has been doing these seminars for over 20 years. Uh, I've had some people ask about, uh, can we have one of these here? And uh, here's what it's going to be about in a nutshell, a small thing. Number one, uh, it's going to cover sometimes some of you who are retired, you are forced to take money after you turn 70 out of your iris, whether you want to or not, whether you need it or not. Uh, and sometimes there are tax consequences as a result of that. There are ways that you can take those and give them away and have no tax consequences. And sometimes that is helpful for folks. So they're going to talk about what the rules are on that. And I will be honest, that is in the context of the fact that we are going to be talking about a building fund very, very soon. So that is one of the reasons for that, because there are people who said, I would love to help. How can we do this? And he has uh, the answers to that question. Number two is, how do you leave a legacy of generosity? Sometimes we think the best thing to do is leave everything we have to our kids. And sometimes we leave it in such a way that we leave tax consequences for them, and they get far less than what we expected. And there are ways in which sometimes you can give away some of that, and your kids end up with more than what they would have. And so he's going to be talking about that. Uh, and there are some people who have some some concerns about some of the new tax rules, and is that going to impact uh, regular church giving, all right? And he is going to address that question as well. Now, here, let me tell you, um, Marion's sitting right up here, and he's an accountant. Do I have any other accountants in the room? I need to know how many people I'm going to offend when I say I've, I've done it in all three services. Um, of course, I have not heard a lot of accountants speak in public forums a lot in my life, but I have on a few occasions. They were a lot like all of my math teachers in school. They weren't real thrilling to listen make a speech. <laughs> like I said, that's not all accountants. It's just ones I happen to have a chance to hear. And so I actually went to, and I met Bob Price. Uh, Bob and his wife just started attending our church recently. Christy has worked for him for years, who's part of our church family. And uh, I actually asked Bob to give me part of the presentation because I wanted to know how hard I was going to push it. And <laughs> uh, he, was, he is passionate. Uh, he is passionate about this subject. He's been doing this thing for 20-some years, and uh, he made it in such a way that I even understood what he was talking about. And this is not just for people who are retired. At whatever age you are, you're going to be thinking about these kind of things. And so it will be from 4 to 5 o'clock next Sunday, probably over in the bridge. If we fill it up, we'll slide over into here. Uh, it's going to be about a 35-minute presentation, and then the rest of the time will be questions and answers. 
All right? So that is next Sunday at 4 o'clock, and I hope to see many of you there. Um, I need to highlight tonight, uh, it is the pie auction. It's one of the biggest things that we do every single year. If you are new to New Hope, you need to come, just even come for half an hour. It's an experience like you probably have never seen before. Uh, And so we hope that you will come and join us. This is where all generations of the church come together to make a difference for our high school kids. Our high school kids are going to Mexico during Easter week. They're working on a project. It's a multi-year project for us. We're building an orphanage starting with a foundation. And um, so uh, that's their project. They've been working very hard already for about two months in preparation for this. And um, they raise funds through the writing of letters. And we provide about two-thirds of the funding through New Hope Church. And most of that comes out of the pie auction tonight. You bring your best dessert, your best main entree, the best dish you make. Uh, You bring it tonight, we auction it off, and then you buy it. I have known people who bought what they brought, (laughs) okay? Uh, And that's okay too. If you don't bring anything, then you can come and bring your cash, checkbook, or credit card. Explained in here, we will take all three tonight, okay? Explains how to do the credit card. First time ever we've done that. So there's an explanation here. If you are bringing something back, all right, Uh, If you do not still have one of these from last Sunday's bulletin, there are some of these yellow forms on the table as you leave through the back doors. We would love for you to take this with you, get the top filled out, and then list your items on the item side that you are bringing. If you are bringing two deep dish peach pies, then put peach pie item one, peach pie item two. Okay? You don't fill out the number over here. They will do that. This just expedites when you bring and drop off and check in. It helps the students get things ready for the auction. You need to bring those things by 5.30 tonight. They'll be here probably starting around 5 o'clock. They're ready to go at 5.15. And um, you can drop them off, go get a Starbucks, and come back if you would like. All right? Uh, The auction starts at 6 o'clock. I will tell you this. There is no message. There is no devotion. This is an auction. We go as fast and furious as we possibly can. I have been up and down with this flu bug the last two weeks. We'll see how fast and furious I am able to go tonight. We might get a few pinch hit auctioneers during the service tonight as well. So uh, come and join us for that. If, uh, If you're not able to purchase something tonight, you can just leave a donation. If you can't come tonight, you can put something in an envelope today, write on it, uh, Mexico Mission. Funds that we take in that may exceed the Mexico Mission Project will be used for missions uh, at some point during the year. So all of it will be used in mission work. So those were the updates I needed to bring to you. Now a couple of prayer requests. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Erin Germante, she was in our last service. She will be in the Heart Hospital this week having... uh, 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 Yeah, an ablation. Thank you. And uh, would appreciate our prayers for her. Uh, Another one I was handed from Angela Monroy. One of her friends, Jerry, is an iron worker on the high-speed rail. And uh, a crane dropped a 10,000-pound pallet of rebar. And it hit him. Uh, He is alive. He is numb from the chest down. And he is in the hospital and would appreciate our prayers. His name is Jerry Ouellette. Uh, The Spurlocks are not with us today. Uh, They're part of our 8 o'clock crowd. Kay's sister has been under hospice care for a while, and when they saw her yesterday, they were advised that um, her sister's passing is very, very close. And so they stayed tonight and will be with her all day today. Frank Hicks uh, had a toe removed this week because of his diabetes at St. Agnes Hospital. He is at Horizon Health now in room 308, and he's up for visitors Milt Pierce is home, and last report I got at the end of the week was still doing very good. And we're grateful for that after they removed a uh, tumor and his right lung. Uh, it was a little more extensive than they thought, but uh, it went very well, and he is home recovering. Uh, Trish Sanchez, who was in a coma for over two weeks, got great news yesterday from her husband, Joe. Uh, she has awakened. She is beginning to speak. She recognizes people, and uh, they're beginning to get some physical activity from her, so we're happy for those developments. Rich Smith that I shared with you last week had a TIA. They thought they discovered a blood clot in his brain, transported him to San Jose so they could take care of it. When they got up there, they found out he did not have a brain. I mean, did not have a blood clot. (laughs) Did not have a blood clot in his brain. All right. Uh, So we are grateful for that miracle. And Rich was in the eight o'clock service today. 
He said, I feel good early in the morning. I get a little tired as the day goes on. So he was at our 8 o'clock service and taught his Sunday school class today. Now, that's the great news for Rich. The bad news is his dad, Dick Smith, had a massive stroke this week and is at St. Agnes Hospital, and things are not very good for him. Uh, John Miller finished his second round of uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatment, um, has to wait until his counts get back up before you can release him to go home. He'll still be kind of confined, and uh, who all can come see him? Uh, and it'll be about a month before they have a decision on whether he will be able to make the next step for a bone marrow transplant or if it has progressed too far for that. So be in prayer for them as they go through this waiting room time right now. This past week, uh, engaged in three different memorial services for Bobby Farina uh, and then for Joyce Martins, who was part of our church family for many, many years. And then on Friday, we had Bill Burmeister, also a member of our church for the last 19 to 20 years. And uh, thank you all so much for the way in which you help out, set up, providing food, clean up. Uh, it makes a difference for these families, and they have always expressed deep thanks. So I pass that back on to you this week. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, it's great to share life with you. It's great to share the adventure of Christ's sufficiency for all the challenges of life that we face. Father, there are things in the uh, regular schedule of our life that uh, is a mixed bag. There are things that are on our schedule that uh, we're excited and have great anticipation for. There are other things that are on our schedule that um, we dread, we, uh, we get concerned about. And then, Father, there are always those surprises to the schedule. And, Father, just because we have surprises doesn't mean that we ought to be unprepared. That is where consistency in a, a daily walk with you, growing in our knowledge of who you are and doing those things that make for a healthy relationship with you, and so, Father, when we, we walk in dependence upon you and we walk in a growing understanding of who you are, when those surprises come, we are not overwhelmed. Lord, there may be some who are here today because they've had some recent surprises in their life and it's brought them to a place where they've said something like, I, I don't know that I can go on like this. I need to find out if there's something more or something else, someone who can make a difference. And Father, New Hope Church is a church that believes there is someone who can make a difference, and it is Jesus Christ. He is sufficient for every need that any of us will ever have. He doesn't always eliminate the problems like a blood clot in Rich's brain this past week. Sometimes the cancer is persistent. Sometimes the clot stays. Sometimes the challenges are still there, but you promise us that you will never leave us or forsake us in the midst of those challenges. You promise to give us a peace that passes understanding and a joy that words cannot adequately express. You see, this is about a relationship, not about our circumstances, and our relationship with you is forever, where our circumstances are only temporary. So Father, may we grow in an understanding of what all that means, and may we learn to do a better job at New Hope of how to express and live and teach that very thing. Thank you for our time today as we worship and honor you with our hearts and our voices lifted up. And thank you that as we open your word that you have some things that you want to share with each of us today. We trust you with the needs. We say thank you for this offering and your sufficiency of meeting the needs of New Hope so that we can carry out your great commission around the world. We commit this to you and so much more in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. <coughs> So, can anybody say amen? amen? Yeah. All right, all right. Hey, uh, uh, Tim. Yes, sir. Um, where are you going? Where am I going? Where are you going right now? I'm going to buy stuff to make some awesome pies. What kind of pies? Sweet potato pie. The best sweet potato pie you've ever had. Auction them off tonight, all right? all right? So he's going, gonna get the stuff that's gonna be on the, uh, on the list tonight. And they're gonna be extra anointed because I'm, I'm making them at Pastor's house. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. I might get to lick the bowl then. Yeah. Um, wow, I just love that song. And, and, and that song, Just Say Amen, is perfect 
for the Open Door series that we're in. It's just an absolutely perfect song. Uh, before we jump into sermon, uh, hey, quiet down back there. Um, we have about a dozen folks from our church who are in prison today. Uh, hopefully they will be released today. Um, they, <laughs> they are there with Prison Fellowship. There is a yard event that is uh, being sponsored by Prison Fellowship at the, women's, uh, at the Chowchilla Women's Facility. Uh, Shauna Bryant, one of our former worship leaders here, is uh, going to be leading worship there and uh, doing some sharing as well. And uh, so I want us to pause just for a moment and pray for that. If you've ever been on a yard event, they never go smoothly. All right, there's always glitches. There's so much that has to get done and accomplished and so much regulations and tape and security. It is always a challenge, uh, but God always shows up. They are incredible experiences and moments. There are going to be some women today who really will discover freedom for the first time in their life. And so we just want to lift that group uh, up in prayer as they are there in ministry. So join with me as we pray for them. Uh, Father, probably at this very moment, uh, part of that service is taking place. And uh, we just certainly lift up those from Prison Fellowship, from our church, from other volunteers, from churches in the community uh, who have joined together for this impact at Chowchilla Women's Facility. Lord, I pray for the women who were there. Many of them who are going to be there are going to be encouraged in a faith that they have discovered already. But there will also be a number of women who will be coming to see what it's all about. And I hope when they discover that what it's all about is a person, and his name is Jesus, and he loves them. He loved them so much that he left his home in heaven and he came to earth and he died a cruel death, not to take care of his own needs, to but take care of the sins of the world. And that includes theirs. And when they discover that incredible love and that marvelous forgiveness, and with that love and forgiveness comes freedom from the condemnation of the things that have bound up their life for years, they'll no longer see walls and bars, but they will see the incredible freedom of Jesus Christ. So we just pray for them at this very moment. Thank you for your presence there as well as here. Thank you for activity in the lives and hearts of those who were there and for those of us who are here. We trust you for this and so much more. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you were part of this service last week, uh, you knew of the dilemma that I have today. All right? The other services didn't find out about the dilemma till this morning. Uh, we survived both of those other services. Here was the dilemma. Uh, last Sunday sermon, I preached in its entirety in the 8 o'clock service. In the 915 service, I only preached about two-thirds of it. And in the 1045 service, I only got halfway through it. How that happened, I have absolutely no idea, all right? Uh, so it presented a challenge for today. Um, and so if you were in a different service last week, you're really confused in this service, all right? Because I'm not sure how. Uh, anyway, it's going to be, partly it's going to be review. Uh, we've got a video clip that we're going to show you of an interview that we did with someone as a result of something that happened two weeks ago uh, here in our church. Um, and then um, we're going to finish up what we didn't finish last week. So let's take just a couple of minutes for review. Uh, so if you have notes from last Sunday, you can pull them out because this is going to be sort of teacher-student time, all right? We're going to do a little sharing here to get us up to uh, where we left off last week. We, we have been looking during this series at seven characteristics of open-door people. Uh, if you're new today, this is a series we started because we did a church-wide small group Bible study. Our 20 Bible studies all over town studied the same thing for the first uh, eight weeks of this year. It was also a theme that was dealt with on Sunday night by Mark Addis and our Sunday night team. Uh, by the way, there will be a Sunday night service here tonight at 6 o'clock. You are certainly welcome to come and share that. Uh, they've wrapped up their series last week, and I told you all a few weeks ago, I'm enjoying this series so much. We're going to stay in this series all the way through the greatest open door in the history of the world, Easter Sunday morning. And so we will wrap up that ser this series on Easter Sunday morning. And so during this time, we have uh, discovered there are seven characteristics of open door people. So let's review those very quickly. Uh, the first one is open door people are? They are ready, ready or not. To be an open door person, we have to learn and it's not about my preparedness for the open door. If we wait till we're prepared, how many open doors will we walk through? Probably none. God, I know that's not my, that open door is for somebody else. It's not for me because I haven't been prepared for this yet. 
Open doors are not about our preparedness, but about our dependency upon Jesus Christ. Believing that if he calls us, he then will equip us. Sometimes the preparation comes in the process of doing. I can't tell you how many Sunday school teachers have told me over the years, Tim, I learned more about the Bible than I ever knew teaching first graders in Sunday school. Often the preparation comes in the process. Second characteristic, our open door people are unhindered by adversity. Good. Adversity is not perceived as an obstacle and obstacles are not understood as don't enter. Just because a door is open doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean there aren't going to be some difficulties along the way. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to let you in on something. I don't know of one open door where it was smooth sailing when you walk through it. I don't know of one in my own life. I don't know of one recorded in the scriptures. I'll be happy if you find one and share it with me, but I don't know of one. When Abraham was asked to leave his homeland and go to the land of Canaan and promised that God would show him once he arrived there, he had problems. We'll highlight a few of those in a moment again. Uh, I don't, uh, Noah, when he was called to build a boat, he had problems. Moses, when he was called to lead the children of Israel, had a couple of million problems. They were a bunch of whining crybabies. Uh, David, becoming king of Israel, had problems. Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elisha, Elijah, you come up with a character and an open door, and they all had challenges. Even the perfect son of Jesus Christ in 33 years of life on this earth, he had challenges and troubles with the open doors that his father provided for him. Open doors is not the absence of of trouble. Number three, open door people are blessed to be blessed. Going through the open door is not about your success. Going through the open door is about how God will bless others through you because you walk through the door. Open doors are not about you. It's about how God will use us. Number four, open door people Resist and persist. We resist discouragement in the face of obstacles and we persist in faithfulness despite long periods of waiting. Okay, uh, surprise parties, what happens? Somebody comes to the door and everybody does what? And then it's over, right? That's not how this works. When we walk through open doors of opportunity that God provides for us, it is not a swift conclusion most of the time. It is sometimes hours, days, weeks, months, and even years. It took the children of Israel 40 years to get through the open door of leaving Egypt. It took Noah a long time to build a boat that big. It took Jesus 33 years to go from the manger to the cross. Open doors is a process and a journey, and there's many times a lot of waiting. Okay, the competition is on now. Eight o'clock service failed miserably. 9.15 service was much more intelligent than the eight o'clock service today. We're going to see how y'all do. There was a key line under this point that was the key line of last Sunday's sermon. And I'm saying key line, not key lime. That might be a pie tonight, all right? But right now, it's the key line from last Sunday's sermon. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, you guys might be as smart as 915. That's right. If you're not dead, you're not done. Don't use your age as an excuse to not walk through an open door. Don't say I'm too old. Abraham, remember, that was an excuse he could have given. He was 75 years old and had not fathered a child yet and God said, you're gonna be the father of a great nation. <laughs> and God, you're a little late getting started with me. And then once he even got the promise, he had to wait another 24 years before he found out that Sarah was pregnant. Wow. If you're not, if you're not dead, you're not done. You can't use being young as an excuse. Timothy tried to use that in the New Testament because he was only a teenager when God called him to ministry. Mm. 
If you're not dead, you're not done. I've had people recently, last couple of years, tell me they can't sing in an Easter or Christmas choir anymore because they're too old. I hope you feel great conviction right now. If you're not dead, you're not done. Hey, so I'm too young. The people in the choir are older. You know what? You'd bring down the average age if some of you would join the choir. You have the ability. Show up Wednesday night for Easter practice, all right? Um, Milo didn't even know I was going to do that today. Open door people have fewer, what? Regrets. You see, often we start our lives, our first 20 or 25 years, and we regret the wrong things we did because we were young and foolish. But by the end of our life, we often regret the open doors we never went through, and we often say, I wonder what if, what would it have been? Then we got to where I think we ended with you all last week, and that is open door people learn a lot about who? Themselves. If I am to go through open doors, I will have to be humble enough to accept my flaws and my failures. God doesn't call perfect people. If he did, he would not be able to call any of us. And last of all, open door people are what? We are not paralyzed by our imperfections. Just because we may blow it after we walk through the open door does not negate God's activity in keeping his promises in our life. We often think you have to be a spiritual giant for God to ask you to walk through an open door, possessing a faith that you don't believe is possible for you. But the scripture reveals exactly the opposite. And we'll look at a few examples of that in a moment. What I want us to do right now, though, is I'm going to turn our attention towards the screen. Uh, a video clip, this was done as a result of a little incident that happened a couple of weeks ago at the end of service. Um, uh, and it was at the end of this service. It was Angela Monroy's mom. Um, uh, she was relatively non-responsive at the end of the service, sitting back there on the pew. Um, it's not the first time I've had people uh, after a sermon be very non-responsive. Uh, but, but, but hers was she couldn't really even get up off the pew, uh, wasn't responding. And um, Don Banta, do you all know who Don Banta is in our church? Okay, a lot of, he's in this service. He's here today. Don, wave. All right, all right. Um, um, people in 8 o'clock service had no clue who you were. It was about a 50-50 split in the last service. Uh, yeah, 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 well, not after today. Um, Don started coming to church about uh, 21 years ago. He started coming to our college group when it was, uh, used to be at our home out in the country. Uh, Shelly Rude is the one who brought him. Uh, Shelly's probably going to deny this story, but the way I remember it is she saw him washing his car without his shirt on across the street <laughs> when, he moved, when he moved in, all right, neighbors to her parents' house when she lived there. And uh, so she invited him to come to our college group, and uh, he did. He was very stimulating to our college group as well. And um, uh, he and Shelly eventually had the privilege of marrying them, and now they are parents of three wonderful and beautiful daughters, high school, junior high, and elementary, right? Got, isn't that a great stage of life to be in? Um, Don is also a fire captain for uh, the Clovis Fire Department. He actually got hired uh, on a Friday, uh, got married on a Saturday, and went to work on a Monday. But then he got four days off so he could go on a honeymoon after that, all right? So uh, one of those things that was very memorable at the time. Uh, here's the deal. I want you to watch this video. It's not earth-shattering. It's just he and I sitting on a couch having a conversation. And what I want you to think about as you listen to this conversation is what, what is there for me to learn about this subject of open doors? What is there for me to learn about open doors? Sit back and watch. So the little red light means we're live? Oh, that's right. Okay, it doesn't mean stop, right? Red light means go. Red light means go. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, New Hope. Um, you find me sitting on a couch over in the bridge with uh, one of the members of our church by the name of Don Banta. Um, I've known Don ever since uh, Shelley first drug him to college group about <laughs> 21 years ago. And um, it's been fun to watch him uh, transition from a single guy to a married guy to a father. He is uh, currently a fire captain, um, probably one of the best in the city of Clovis, and uh, we are so glad to have you part of our church. And it was just Sunday a week ago, Don, you had a little open door experience uh, at the end of the 1045 service. Um, why don't you tell our church family about what happened? 
uh, mother-in-law actually came and told me that there was a, a lady who was kind of unconscious, I guess. Uh, and when I went and met her, her name was Angie. Uh, she was altered, very, uh, very low heart rate, and probably, uh, obviously not, not doing well. So I just stayed with her until Amer American showed up, and uh, just so happened it was Clovis Engine 43 that showed up as well. <laughs> Um, and just kind of stayed with her uh, until they loaded her up and transported her. One of the things we have to remember is it's not really an emergency for us, it's an emergency for them. So they're not used to seeing it. Uh, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty typical that we have to calm the family down just to even get to the answers. And it's, sometimes it's hard, we'll get, we'll get numb to it, and we have to remember that we're there, we're there for them. Um, what I just want to say thank you for is as a pastor, it was very comforting to me to have somebody with your expertise uh, who was willing to respond to an emergency that we had at the end of a service and uh, you did it with a great sense of calmness and assurity and that made the, the, the whole situation much, much better. And uh, it, I, what I want people to understand from this is that open doors come in all kinds of sizes and shapes and packages. It's, it's not just going to the mission field, but it's just being who God has called us to be and using what abilities and talents we have uh, for a bigger purpose than just ourselves. And you did that on a pew here. And that led to another conversation with some who were standing around you afterwards uh, about how you've been looking for open doors at the workplace. And I'd like you to talk about that just a little bit. I'm trying to be a good example for the guys. That basically uh, showing them that no matter who the person is that we're there for, uh, everybody deserves some human dignity. I think what we talked about, um, over the years, there's been lots of fear put in us. Still be hard. <laughs> I remember the first time, uh, it, was, it was somebody had passed, and I went and I hugged the daughter. And my daughter, she was still 65 years old. And I was, I was afraid to do that my entire career because I don't want to offend anybody, or I don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. What I didn't like anymore is walking away from a call of somebody who had just passed away and saying, have a nice day, see you later, leaving their dead family member on the floor, waiting for the coroner, waiting for the cops. I didn't like it anymore. So instead, I stay a little bit longer. I'll give them a hug. We'll talk with them. Um, walk through that door. And I was afraid when I did. I still am every time because you, you don't know how the person's going to react. I mean, simply saying... God bless you. Meaning not like because you sneezed, but, <laughs> yeah. but that, it could be very offensive. And we're not supposed to, we're supposed to be pretty secular on the job. Uh, Non-political, uh, and I get that. But sometimes somebody needs that extra human touch. And, you know, with all of the things going on, the Me, Me Too movement or whatever, it, it, it's, it's scary. And uh, my guys, um, I think it still makes them uncomfortable. Maybe it doesn't. They don't, we don't really talk about it. We do talk about what we just talked about. I have talked to them about, I don't want to just show up, uh, do CPR on their family member, and then let them know they pass, and then just leave, say, have a, nice, have a nice day. I don't like that. Have you found it rewarding when you've taken that extra step and you've overcome your fear? To yes. Yes. You said you talk about opening doors. Every time we go to a call, you have no idea where I don't know how many times we've had to kick open doors, um, and, and you're afraid, you know? Uh, I mean, it's a physical door. It's a physical fear because uh, there's been a couple calls where we opened the door and there was somebody standing on the other side not too happy to see us. And they didn't know that we were coming. You know, uh, the wife might have called or they have an alert button that goes off and they can't get in, they can't get in touch with them. Uh, or somebody got woken up in the middle of the, in the, middle of the night. It's so... We got policies we're changing to try to, you know, keep us safe, but it's, there's always fear. Part of what I'm hearing you say, don't let me put words in my mouth, so, or in your mouth, so make sure I'm um, responding to what you're saying appropriately, and that is, you are looking for ways, uh, the right ways, to express compassion through your work. Yes. And I think that's one way in which Christ's love gets seen through us. You may not be using his name, uh, you may not always be quoting a passage of scripture, but you are allowing your expression 
um, to reach out in a very positive way when those opportunities are there. But thank you for using um, your job to be a place as an open door to express the love of Christ through. And thank you for being part of New Hope Church family. Thanks for accepting <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't want it any other way. And may I just remind you that it is a, uh, it, it is a factual truth that uh, you look 10 pounds heavier on screen than you. <laughs> you see that fat preacher? Damn, the Christmas. Okay, so uh, what, what spoke to you out of that in regards to open doors? Okay, showing compassion. That's an open door. Good. I don't want to just show up. Okay. Um, let, let, I want to unpack that just a little bit because that's key because that, that, I don't have to ask another question now. Um, what was that in Dawn that prompted him to want to do something more? Yeah. There was a sense of, of dissatisfaction. Okay, so out of dissatisfaction, there's got to be something more that can be done. And that's so then you begin to look for open doors. All right, good. Sometimes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah, so with risk always creates a greater sense of what? Fear, yeah, fear, yeah. And, 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 and what overcomes fear is faith. Um, and I hope you heard Don say, every time. The fear doesn't go away. It was the, uh, it was the world famous philosopher John Wayne who said, <laughs> who said, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's being afraid and saddling up anyway. And, and, and that is true. It's faith is what gives us that kind of courage. All right? Uh, we're going to come right back to that. My dad just walked in. Dad, don't leave after this service until you see Tony and Joyce. Did you hear me? Don't leave till you see Tony and Joyce. All right? All right. All right. All right. Very good. Um, for those of you who don't know, that was my dad. All right? It's a little father-son time here. Um, yeah, okay. So what else? What else? Yes. Ah, uh, Okay. I, probably how I would, would, would possibly say that is the, the, the average person in the world probably understands it's just fine. It's our political correctness has caused people to misconstrue that, and you're absolutely correct. So, uh, I, may I just point out an observation so far? Only the women in this congregation have been observant. <laughs> uh, just, just a thought, guys. Yes. Oh, all right. Oh, oh all right. Yeah. That's a high school student. Okay. All right. Good. What else about open doors? Yes, sir. First man. Good. Being ready for the opportunity that comes up, as he was with Angie, sitting here in our own church, ready to use his skill and expertise. And if you would have seen him with her, so kind, checking her pulse, getting, you know, her blood pressure as he could, and doing that without her really even knowing or, 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 or being aware of it, and just keeping her very, very calm. Um, and 
waiting until the, prof- the other professionals got here so they could take over. So, yeah, seizing the opportunity. Yes, Bill. I only saw one. I don't know how they got that high one, but they should have gone from here up. And that's what you got out of it? Is that, is that, is that, is that. That's, uh, that's one of your elders and the leader of the college group now. That's, uh, Um, I'm not even sure where to go after that one, actually. (laughs) The key thing is um, open doors are, are not mystical. Open doors are not necessarily large movements. Open doors are the little moments in life that God gives us an opportunity to be his hands, his feet, and his voice. And not always all three at the same time. Sometimes it is just our presence, the willingness to go. Sometimes it is the touch. Sometimes it is the words. And sometimes it's a combination of all of them. Um, and we've taken longer in this service than we did the other. So here's what I'm going to do. We're, um, we're, yeah, yes, you may. You are a lot better than you were the first few times I saw you in a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bless you, Jan. I hadn't seen you come in today. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Um, open door people l- learn about themselves. Uh, Abraham learned a lot about himself through the process uh, of being asked to go to a land that would become his and his future generations. He did not go through all of that perfectly. He had to learn to accept some failure in his own life. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, when, he got to, when he got into Egypt, he told his wife, he said, uh, Sarah, you're, you're, so, you're 65, but you are still so beautiful that some of the people in Egypt might want you. Let's not tell them you're my wife because they might want to kill me. Great husband, huh? So let's just tell them you're my sister. And so they did. And so you know what Pharaoh did? He thought... Abram's wife that he thought was his sister was beautiful and he took her into his harem. Yeah, go be, read the story to the book of Genesis. And then, uh, and then you know what? He even paid her brother. He paid him for her. And do you know what Abram said? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he didn't raise a stick and thank you. Hey, I, I came out on this deal all right. I'm still alive and I got paid. See you, Sarah. And then somehow God revealed to Pharaoh, who didn't believe in the God of soon-to-be Israel, that Abram and Sarah's God was not happy with them because they had lied. And so he went to Abram, and and, and this is what I find fascinating. Um, Pharaoh asked Abram the same question that God asked Eve after the fall. What have you done? What have you done? And God might be asking you that very same question today. What have you done? And Abram, and then he gave Sarah back to Abram, and he set them free. Uh, An apostate Pharaoh was more concerned about the God of Abraham than Abraham was at that moment. 
Fear causes us to do some goofy things. But please notice this. It didn't nullify Abraham from walking through the open door. Walking through open doors reveals to us some things about ourselves. Sometimes we think we are very strong in our faith. We hold some views very strongly and we think they're right. Uh, uh, and then, then we discover at some point in our journey that we're not as strong as we thought we were. Uh, for example, here's one. Uh, if you ask me, I'll tell you, I really believe in the marriage of equal servanthood where husbands and wives equally share in the division of labor. And, and yet in reality, I've often found myself doing far more than my fair share around the house and robbing Shelly of her opportunity to serve. <laughs> yeah, she told me the last service, from now on, just call me your sister, <laughs> like Abraham did. And, and just, I lie a lot sometimes, all right? No, I'm kidding, I don't lie a lot, but I... But we often talk about what we view in family relationships until the pressure's on, and then we discover maybe we don't view that quite the way we thought we did. Here's another example that most of us can probably really relate to, and it's real. It's what, what's our relationship to money and possessions? Jesus made it very clear it's more blessed to give than to receive, and he said don't be anxious about possessions or money, but trust your Father in heaven. Uh, I think... And probably most of us in the room would say, uh, that's what I believe. I don't put my trust in money. But then if I actually go through the door of generous or sacrificial giving, if the economy dips, or if I suddenly have less money than I thought I did, I get anxious and stressed and a little worried. Turns out maybe I don't believe I don't trust in money as long as I have money. But when I lose some, keeping in mind that even then I'm still not going to starve and I'm still better off than most of the world, my real beliefs are revealed. Maybe I do trust in money a lot more than I thought. When I walk through an open door, I often learn truths about myself that I would not have learned had I stayed on the other side. We'll wrap it up with this. When open door people are not paralyzed by their imperfections. If you read the story that Paul tells about Abraham that I read last week, I think in chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, Paul sanitizes the story of Abraham. He says, against all hope, Abraham believed. And, and, and that is true, but if you didn't know about the Sarah thing, if you didn't know about some of his other mistakes along the way, it would sound like he went through without a problem. That's not the case. Uh, he does reveal to us in the book of Romans that Abram knew Abram wasn't in denial with his own impotency to carry out what God wanted to do. Abram said, I'm as good as dead, and Sarah, my wife, she's, her womb was as good as dead as well. What we find out in this story that Paul tells us in the book of Romans is that um, Abram never stopped going where God was sending. He may stumble along the way, but Abraham reveals to us it's not about our perfection, but it is about Christ's sufficiency. We don't give up on God. Abram went. Chapter 12, verse 4 of Genesis. Abram went as the Lord had told him. Why was his faith regarded as strong? Because he finally did wait for the son that God would give him. Abram was not in denial. He faced his own inadequacies. He couldn't understand how a man at his age and a woman, Sarah's age, could give birth to a child when they were 90 and 100 years old. Couldn't understand that. I, I don't understand. Well, never mind. I can't go there. Um, he didn't even have any pharmaceutical companies to help him, all right, at that age in life. And he waited on God. And so the hero of the story is not Abraham, it's God. And the hero of our story needs to be God, not us. You see, it's better to have a little faith in a great God than it is to have a big faith in a little God. And that is what Abraham teaches us. It is not the quality of our faith, but it is the object of our faith that is what is to be so very, very important to us. 
Ernest Kurtz, in a book called The Spirituality of Imperfection, says an ancient sage named Marcarius used to point out that if all we did was make progress in the Christian life, we would become conceited, and conceit is the ultimate downfall of Christians. Maybe that's why God recorded the imperfections of so many of his children so that we would be encouraged to keep trusting in a great God even when our own imperfections get in the way. God began the redemption project with a call to an imperfect Abraham, and the imperfect Abraham then had Isaac. Was he perfect? Oh, no. And then he had Jacob. <laughs> Was Jacob perfect? Oh, no. And then eventually, down the road, there became disciples. They were fishermen, James and John. Were they perfect? No, neither was their mother. And then there were tax collectors. And then there were prostitutes. And then there were lepers, none of them perfect. Sometimes people answered the call and walked through the open door. And when they did, they got to be part of his story. But I'm also here to tell you there are some folks who didn't walk through the door. There was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, hey, go sell all that that you've got. Give it away. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Scripture tells us the rich young ruler walked away sad. He chose not to go through the open door and is not part of his story. One day... Before all of eternity, God the Father called the Son and he said, Son, it's time for you to go. He said, Son, it's time for you to leave your home in heaven and it's time for you to go to earth. You're going to go to a manger and you're going to go to a carpenter shop and you're going to flee to Egypt as a fugitive. You're going to go to banquets that no good rabbis would ever attend because they'll be tax collectors and prostitutes. And you're going to go to houses where they make holes in the roofs just to get down to you because they're so excited that you've come. You're going to go to where lepers are and you're going to go to the crippled and you're going to go to the blind and the impoverished and the sin-soaked and the hopeless then one day son you're going to walk a path that will take you to a cross and you're going to bleed and you're going to die to forgive the sins of the world and then you're going to go to a tomb oh but then son death is going to find out it can't hold you and it can't stop you and on the third day the stone will be rolled away and the door will be open and you're going to bring joy to the world as far as the curse is found God still calls today and God still wants to send. And if you say yes, all oh, the places you will go and the people you will touch. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to discover the places just the other side of open doors? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your the record of history. Thank you that you didn't sanitize the lives of your children in both the Old and the New Testament. Thank you, Father, you recorded them warts, blemishes, and all. That gives us hope. Thank you that there were stumbles and falls and you picked them up again and you kept them on your path. Our failures don't disqualify us. Father, the only thing I've discovered in Scripture that disqualify us is a lack of faith. We choose willfully to throw faith out the window and live life on our own. Father, thank you for teaching us lessons about how faith can overcome fear and your righteousness can overcome our sin. May we have the eyes to see and the will to walk through open doors you give to us in our workplace, in our home, in our church, in our community. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. When am I going to see you next? Tonight. tonight. Six o'clock service tonight is the pie auction. Come join us.